Welcome to the Lunch Hour with Mr. Credit. I mean, I wake up in the morning, I piss excellence. You know, I'm just a big, hairy American winning machine. And today, it's Fastball Friday. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. And today, anything goes. Quick hitting, local and relevant topics. We only have one veteran in the studio today. A wily veteran. All right. Elizabeth right. Story <laughs> is here from StoryRealtors.com. Uh, Elizabeth, you've been coming on the show for uh, close to a year. Close to a year, yeah. At this point in time. Mm-hmm. And this is, of course, your first real estate debate. It's my first real estate debate. How do you feel? Do you feel you have an advantage because you've been on the show before in today's debate? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm taking these guys down. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm little, just little girl power action there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, it's great to have you, of course. Uh, you. Elizabeth Story from StoryRealtors.com. Of course, we're streaming uh, at MrCredit.tv. Elizabeth, what do you think? Buyer's market, seller's market, balance market? I still think we're very much in a seller's market. I still think it's also a little bit of a dysfunctional market. I think that there's still a huge inventory shortage, so there's still a lot of sellers who would sell if they knew they wouldn't have a problem finding somewhere else to live. So it's still a bottleneck where you've got a lot of well-qualified buyers ready to buy, but there's nothing out there still for them to buy. And it varies greatly by zip code to zip code within the county on whether the inventory is starting to pick up or not. So it's really a micro market kind of thing. Uh, when you say dysfunctional, specifically, mm-hmm. um, what do you what do you mean by that? Is it a dysfunctional seller's market? I think that's pretty specific. I gave you a point for that. Uh, but explain it to me. I think it's a dysfunctional seller's market because um, it takes a tr- tremendous amount of bravery for a seller to even put their home on the market because they either know that they're going to, A, probably have to find temporary housing or B, go in and start competing with all of the other buyers for their move up or move down property. And I think that that's a dysfunctional way for anyone who wants to list their home to have to approach it with sort of this trepidation of either I've got to carry two mortgages for a while and buy something before I list my property, write a contingent offer, or just get out there and compete. And it's really tough when you're already in a low inventory state to get a contingent offer accepted depending on the price point and the other inventory on the market. So is there any way to leverage that uh, in the marketplace if you are a seller um, to leverage the fact that you kind of have the goods right there to help yourself on the buy side? Is that possible? What do you, how do you mean? like? Meaning, you know, hey, I've got a home for sale. Everybody wants to buy it. Is there any way that I can look at that and leverage it myself? For example, if there are 20 people who want to buy my house, can I go, hey, do any, any 20 of those people selling a house that might be Oh, yeah, house? absolutely. No. I mean, that would be a great I- idea. In fact, you could even do some sort of real estate exchange in a situation such as that. Um, so, yeah, that would definitely be a leverage. But, again, you're probably going to be also looking for a diamond in the rough. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've got the whole MLS and the whole county at your disposal. What are the odds that the one person whose house you want wants your house too? I'm not <laughs> saying it can't be done. <laughs> but I'm not going to say that it's really going to be an easy thing to do. I'm just debating about whether I should give her a point for standing me on my head right there. <laughs> yeah. uh, what do you think, Elizabeth? Is uh, Fannie Mae doing the right thing here? Um, or is it too little too late? I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. I think it should have and could have happened a lot sooner, but at least it's happening at all. There is still some inventory to get cleared out, so at least they've taken a step in the right direction. Hopefully, if we ever had a situation such as that again where they needed to make a decision, they could just do it maybe a little quicker. Elizabeth, let's move to you here. What do you think? I, I have problem? to agree. It's I still think it's inventory, and I don't feel like it's just inventory for first time home buyers because I have clients all across the spectrum all the way from 300 up to like 6 million and it, it I have a common vein with all of them is, is that there's not enough inventory for what they're looking for. So I definitely still think that the biggest problem is the inventory shortage. And to speak a little on the new construction in San Diego, because I have sold some of the new construction in San Diego, it's not exactly um, reasonably affordable without the HOA fees. I mean, one of the units I sold, it was almost $800,000 for a condo in Mission Valley. That's not going to really? be your average first-time home buyer. So I think it's really, we got to look back at what Marie said is affordability when especially when you're including the Melarus, the HOA on the initial price point when you add them all together a lot of your average first time home buyers are already out of the market okay I, I, I can I can certainly understand that because it just doesn't seem like you can get much in the three to four hundred thousand dollar range anymore things seem to start in the fives or at least what's available for sale. Well, that's one thing that I've been hitting with some uh, with some listings that I had, that they're trying to be a little bit unrealistic on the pricing. They think they're going to bank out big time, like um, like during the early 2000s, but it's not like that. We're growing steadily, 
but we're not having we're not having that huge balloon that we had we seen before. Okay, Elizabeth. Well, and and to speak to that, it's because you have a lot more informed buyers who are doing a lot more research. They want to make sure that they're not getting stuck in a bubble either. So they are going to be somewhat conservative, unless it's just your multimillionaire who just wants that property and has to have it. They're going to be conservative in their approach as well. So they may want your property, but they're also wanting to pay at market value, not an unrealistic number that might be slightly over. That's a very, very good point. Even though rents are up. The, the, the amount that it costs you to buy the same place is getting to the point where it doesn't pencil for some people. So we'll go back and switch directions again. Mauricio, what say you to that? Yeah, I think we're getting close to that because the rental prices have been going up due to the lack of inventory and all the things that we have gone through with a short sale. So if we have, if we're, we're creating a market that it's going to be equal to rent out and buy, a lot of people are going to stick with renting. It makes it a lot easier to choose to yeah, rent, right? Because they're, yeah, they're, I mean, plus they're not paying taxes for the property and, 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 and other factors like that. So that's that's a dangerous place to be at in, in the market. Okay, I agree. I do. I definitely think it's a dangerous place. I want to make sure that everybody always factors in everything that they get. So let's say you buy, you've got appreciation, and you have tax deductions on top of you know any taxes that you're paying. So making sure that when people are penciling those numbers out, they're always keeping those things into consideration. But I think it also, again, you have to go back to what the price point is. For example, I have a client who's in the three million range, and they were trying to buy a replacement home, but they can't rent a home of that luxury status for what they can buy one for. So it's really going to be, again, also specific to the price range. Anything under 500 I think you can still pretty much even or rent it cheaper than buy. But once you start getting into the millions and above, then it's kind of a different market. Interesting. We just talked about kind of the biggest problems in today's real estate market. I want to flip to the biggest strengths. So Elizabeth, we'll start with you. Uh, what, do, what do you think is the biggest strength in today's real estate market? I think one of the biggest strengths in today's real estate market is well-qualified buyers. We're still seeing you know, a decent amount of cash buyers or people who are at least putting 20% down. Underly- underwriting is now more stringent than it was before the bubble burst. So you, they're properly underwritten files with people who have real money and real assets and real jobs who can afford the payment. So I definitely think that that's a big strength. And that's one of the things that has always made me feel confident that hopefully prices and buyers are staying in line that people can still continue to afford their payments as long as people can continue to afford their payments then you don't see abandoned homes you don't see short sales and you don't see foreclosures which helps the market stay balanced and it helps everybody on the street to continue to have property appreciation so I definitely think that that is one of our biggest strengths right now in the San Diego market is that the people who are successfully finding a property and getting an offer accepted is well qualified buyers and also I think that that when the market fell apart, you got rid of a lot of professionals who really had no business being in the business. And so people have learned from all of those mistakes and only people who do a good job and can continue to do a good job are in the industry. And when true industry professionals are working together with truly qualified people, it helps the industry as a whole as we move forward. And let me recap that really quick. And if anyone has rebuttals, uh, just hold on for one second. Uh, what Elizabeth is saying is that well-qualified buyers, meaning people who can afford to buy the homes they're buying in the past, we didn't have well-qualified buyers, and people really couldn't afford to buy the homes they were actually buying. So what she means by that is the people who are purchasing today are proven on paper to qualify fully uh, for the payments that they're making, which means they should be uh, on firmer ground in the marketplace. And what she means by uh, the shakeout uh, in the downturn is that there were a lot of people who were working at the coffee shop, decided to you know start doing real estate um, because they knew a couple of people were buying some houses. And that has kind of gone away through the tougher times in the market. Those people went back to the coffee shop and so forth. Um, and so now you have the best of the best left in the market. And, and I would totally agree with both those points. Any, any rebuttals for Elizabeth? No, no, not at all. I think those are great points. This is a smarter market. Yeah. yeah. So, Elizabeth, I do have a quick rebuttal. Okay. Uh, do you believe that although these, these well-qualified buyers are there, um, no question about it, the buyers are well uh, much more qualified than in the past, but do you believe that those well-qualified buyers uh, are, are without the ability to make mistakes? No. 
No, I don't think anybody's without the ability to make mistakes. I mean, you can't predict what's going to happen with your company. You can't predict if you're going to have layoffs. You can't predict if the market will shift. Um, but I think that at least people are more conservative and thoughtful and careful in their approach. It's not like stated, stated, no doc type of loans where people were just completely lying about their financials and there was almost no risk because you could also get 100% financing. I mean, when people are lying about their income and doing 100% financing, why not buy a million dollar house? It's not going to cost me anything to walk away. You're not seeing that anymore. Minimum 5% down, usually more. And people are going to have to prove for real that who they are is who they are. Yeah, how much they make is how much yeah, they make. Okay. Exactly. That. All right. All right. Makes sense. Elizabeth Story, what do you think? Best bang for your buck. San Diego County. All right. Well, before I get into that, I just want to say quick congratulations to you on becoming director of real estate for UTSanDiego.com. Yeah. Yay, Derek. What All an right. achievement. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very excited to see the professionalism and expertise that I know you will bring to the content. So good for everyone in San Diego. Point for Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. And now to bang for your buck, you know, I think we're all probably going to be a little bit biased. I chose to move to Carlsbad. It's got an ocean, a lagoon. I could get the space that I wanted. I could get the size of the home that I wanted. It's closer to like L.A. or Temecula if you're hopping out of town occasionally. You can choose a property with or without HOA because they have both in Carlsbad. You have all the way from old Carlsbad to the newer parts of Carlsbad. They have great schools. They just added a new high school. It's a STEM school. Uh, They have parks, luxury hotels. They have an airport. They have some really great museums and luxury shopping. I mean, you really can't beat everything that Carlsbad bad has. Wow. That was crushing. There's, a, right there. wow, there's a lot of good stuff. Right there. <laughs> Interestingly, Whoa. when the market recovered, Carlsbad was one of the top five zip codes in San Diego that did recover. So yep. yeah. I'll give, well, you, that I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah with three bedroom, two bath. So another thing about Carlsbad, it goes all the way down. I actually showed one of the lowest priced condos in Carlsbad yesterday to an investor client. It was priced at two ten, all the way up to the one of the highest price listings in Carlsbad right now is twenty nine million. So no matter what your price point is, you can find it somewhere in Carlsbad. I'd say the average three bedroom, two bath is um, in the six sevens, depending on where you are. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, that's certainly in Carlsbad. We've been hearing Carlsbad, Carlsbad, Carlsbad for quite some time, and I think you just found out why. (laughs) Good stuff, Elizabeth. Well, that's it for today. That is the first real estate debate coming to a conclusion. I really appreciate all of our guests today. Elizabeth Story from StoryRealtors.com. You are the wiener Woo-hoo! today. Yeah. You have won the very first real estate debate. So that will be posted on the website, mrcredit.org. Right. 